Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And Paranormal Expeditions. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This 5-Minute Mystery is being brought to you by the year 2022. What will it be like? Who will be the star? Well, one thing is for sure, that the FMM will continue to entertain us. I'm not sure I understand. Neither do I, but... Here we go anyway. Well, Alice, one more block and you'll behold the Brooks household. Two whole years, Jim. It just doesn't seem possible it's been so long. You and Dorothy married and with a place of your own. Yeah, that's true, all right. Only too bad you haven't taken advantage of the old Brooks hospitality sooner. Well, I'm here now and I intend having a perfectly wonderful time. Now, here we are. <laughs> oh, what a charming place this is. Uh, Dorothy's probably on needles and pins waiting for me to get you here. A darling, it's Jim. Here's Alice. Jim, look. What? Where? There on the living room floor. It's Dorothy. Dead. Mr. Brooks, I'm afraid you and Miss Manning will have to submit to some routine questioning. Well, I'll be happy to help in any way I can, Inspector. (sighs) Thank you, Miss Manning. Now, Mr. Brooks, while we're waiting for some information I phoned for, I want you to tell me exactly what happened this morning. There's nothing much to tell. Both my wife and I were quite excited, expecting Alice, that is, Miss Manning here, to visit us from Chicago. I was to wait until she called me at the office. And you were there all morning? Yes, until Miss Manning's train arrived and we came out here. Well, I had written Mrs. Brooks, Inspector, telling her that I'd called Jim at the office as soon as I arrived. The train was an hour later. We could have been here early and maybe have prevented this. Oh, well, that remains to be seen. Apparently, Mrs. Brooks was sitting here in this chair, putting red polish on her fingernails... When she was shot from behind, the polish had spilled all over the carpet and she was still holding the tiny brush in her hand. She must have recognized her attacker and since she did not die instantly, she printed these three initials here on the floor with the polish. D-O-C. D-O-C. I wish we could tell whose initial she was trying to reveal. You're sure you don't know anyone whose name would fit that? Positive, I can't. Uh, Why, why that... Yes, Miss Manning? Can you think of somebody with the initials? Well, I... D-O-C spells Doc, and it's Mr. Brooks's nickname. Well, it can't be. Yes, I Mr. Have... Brooks? I haven't been called Doc for over two years. It, it was a nickname I picked up in school. My wife didn't like the name and never used it. Nobody in New York even knows me by the Doc. You've got to believe me, Inspector. It's the truth. Mm, well, that we'll see. Just a minute. Hello? Yes, Grady? Yes? I see. Well, it's sewed up anyway. Thanks. Well, you both will be happy to know our little murder is solved. Oh, then then it wasn't Doc after all. No, Miss Manning, it wasn't Doc. I'm arresting you, Miss Manning, for the murder of Dorothy Brooks. Why did the inspector arrest Miss Manning for the murder of Mrs. Brooks? In a moment, we'll hear, but first... I have to wonder what information the detective was waiting for. Agreed. And I'll bet it holds the clue to the solution. It's hard to deduce the crime without facts. Motive and opportunity help as well. But I'm sure that she's guilty. What makes you so sure? Well, my British friend, these detectives are never wrong. I want to believe. Ooh, an X-Files reference. 
And now, back to our story. How dare you arrest me? I was still on the train. Your train wasn't late, Miss Manning. That phone call just verified the fact. You came out here, murdered Mrs. Brooks, returned to the station, and called Mr. Brooks to pick you up. But that wasn't what really gave you away, Miss Manning. Too bad you didn't know Mr. Brooks was no longer called Doc when you printed those letters on the carpet. The next time you leave a name as a clue to throw suspicion, you'd better get the name right. But of course, there won't be a next time, will there, Miss Manning? Oh my gosh, so very lame. Are you referring to the story or the utter lack of clues? Both. How could we ever solve the crime? You cannot. However, the acting was excellent, and I could really feel her shock and dismay. My guess is, is that you're easily entertained. And you're still an idiot. Proud member since 1984. Is that you said? Hello and welcome to the podcast. It is a new year, and with that comes new things to Ron's Amazing Stories. On the show a couple weeks ago, I told you that we are going to be making some improvements. We're going back to our roots, and we'll have more interviews with authors, composers, and anyone who might have a story to tell. We're going to improve how you submit your stories, and that's something that you've been asking for. I'm even hoping to do some live streams this year with you guys. When do we start? Well, we start today. On the podcast, we have a brand new segment called Our Amazing Stories. This one is something I've been thinking about for quite a while. We have a segment for your stories, one for strange events in history, one for old-time radio trips in time, Johnny Is It True, stories read by you, and of course, Ghost Stories with Sylvia. All good stuff, but what about the rest of the stories that we're missing? Well, that's a pretty big chunk, but to fill some of that gap, I present our amazing stories. This will be about people and the things that they've done. It might be historical, current, or even futuristic. Who can say? For example, Today, we are heading into our past to look at the story of John F. Kennedy and PT-109. This is a story that has always amazed me. I first heard about it from a book written by Richard Trigaskis. I read it when I was a kid. Then again from the 1963 war film starring Cliff Robertson as Kennedy. Both do a great job, but the real story is truly epic And that is what we have for you today. Also on the show are more of your stories, and even a classic from the golden age of science fiction. So relax and sit back as we begin with this from Audible. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle. Whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to? Shade Slinger. The Ripple System, Book 1, by Kyle Kieran, and narrated by Travis Baldry. If you are a gamer whose life revolves around the RPG, role-playing game, you are going to love this book. I found it on the list, and I wasn't so sure about it, but when I clicked that play button, I was totally hooked. This is the most original, creative, and exciting book that I have listened to in a very long time. It takes you into the world of video gaming like nothing I have ever heard before. Corporate flameout Ed Altimer dreams of leaving his world behind. 
So when Earthblood Online splashes into the VR MMORPG scene, he dives in and never looks back. VR MMO stands for Virtual Reality Massively Multiplayer Online. Here's a clip from the book that should give you an idea of what I'm talking about. I took off my pants, grabbed the four-person sushi platter I'd ordered off the kitchen counter, and plopped onto the couch. Are you certain I can't order you something healthier, sir? House said, her toneless voice sounding from every direction at once. She was a one-of-a-kind AI I'd inherited from my father, and while she made for a pretty effective digital maid, she could be a little overbearing. There's nothing wrong with rice and fish, I said. With all due respect, House said, a meal designed for a family of four is never healthy when eaten alone. Perhaps you'd like some company. Mmm, I said. Pass. What about Ethan? House said. Shall I see if he's free? Why? So he can spend the whole evening hounding me to invest in whatever doomed product he's currently pushing? Yeah, no. I skewered a piece of volcano roll with a plastic fork and shoveled it into my mouth. I hate that guy. I'm still annoyed I ever considered him a friend. Perhaps Stephanie, then. You haven't responded to her messages, and she has been trying to contact you for the better part of a month. Nope, I said. I don't have any interest in having a girlfriend who thinks I should pay her rent two months into a relationship just because I can. Been down that road too many times before, and I know exactly where it leads. Aiden might. I'm fine, House, I said, around a mouthful of spicy tuna. I don't need company. I don't want company. But, sir, it's your birthday, and societal norms dictate you ought to spend your birthday with those you're closest to. I grabbed a warm beer off the floor, cracked it, and raised it in a mock toast. Well, here we are, House, to a birthday with my closest friend. House hesitated. Do I misunderstand, or are you referring to me, sir? I sure am. It still felt a little strange to vocalize that to a glorified computer, and House was a far cry from a real person, but in a lot of ways she was the perfect friend. She was even-keeled, unflinchingly honest, and endlessly supportive, and I never worried she was only sticking in my orbit because I had money. Oh, House said. I am flattered, sir. However, I maintain that some human contact would be beneficial to your long-term health. Several recent studies suggest those who willingly isolate themselves from society for prolonged periods. Or, and I want you to hear me out on this, I could spend my birthday doing exactly what I want, which is to watch Earthblood Online air their first trailer, alone, so I can enjoy it in peace. I apologize, House said. In hindsight, it is clear I've overstepped the bounds of my role. I am simply concerned for your well-being. I know, I know, but I really am fine, House. This trailer is going to be the first look at actual gameplay that EBO has put out. I've been looking forward to this game for years, and finally getting some concrete details on how the world works is going to be amazing. Today's going to be a good day, I promise. I understand. How can I be of assistance? Can you turn on the telewall and see if Tyran's live? He's one of the streamers introducing the game. I glanced at my phone, and the trailer should be hitting the feeds any minute now. Of course, I'll tap you into his stream. The entirety of the opposite wall, a twenty-foot-wide panoramic window that spanned ceiling to floor, flashed from transparent to black, presenting me with a bird's-eye view of an army of red-skinned orcs crashing into a much larger force of elves. Tyran looked out from a window in the bottom left quadrant of the screen, his sun-tanned face showing no strain whatsoever as he micromanaged dozens of units while chatting with his viewers. He paused the game and cleared his throat. Hey, guys, the moment we've all been waiting for is finally here. Oh, my God, I said. This is it. I tossed my fork onto the platter and leaned forward on the couch, hands on knees. Everything in me had gone electric. It felt like my very bones were buzzing. I'm thrilled to be one of the streamers chosen to present the first ever glimpse into Earthblood Online, Tyran said. For those of you who have been living under the world's largest rock, this is the VR MMO I've been raving about for the last few months. You know, the one I took out a second mortgage for so I could upgrade my pod. Supposedly, EBO was the first game to offer complete immersion. That means smell, taste, everything. Can you even imagine what that would feel like? A game you can play without your senses constantly reminding you that what you're experiencing isn't real. 
I can't be the only one who's tired of sitting down to these legendary-looking feasts only to bite into a turkey leg that tastes like cardboard. He paused and shook his head. Anyway, here it is. Let's all just hope it measures up to the hype. I cupped the sides of my face with both hands. I felt my pulse in my fingertips. The telewall faded to black. While that clip does a pretty good job, the rest of the book is so much better. The game does come out and Ned, not wanting any competition, buys an exclusive access to the game's three-day head start period. His only companion is a ridiculously handsome talking axe named Frank, who has knowledge of the game's deepest secrets. The problem is, is that the magnificent Frank rarely shares any of them. Another issue is that the Head Start Advantage makes Ned a target. Once it ends, his fellow players will stop at nothing to rip Frank right out of his hands. So in 72 hours, the greatest manhunt in gaming history will begin. And brother, it is a whole lot of fun. Now, if that appeals to you, head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories and you can have Shade Slinger for free. Here is what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This also gains you access to the included catalog, which is updated constantly with new titles. So to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Thank you, Audible. And now it's time for your stories. These are your stories sent by you for you. Our first story comes from returning contributor and friend of the podcast, Akuna Musa. This is the third story he has submitted, but the first time he's using his real name. Akuna wants us to know that he hails from New York and is an Uber driver there. He wants to write the great American novel and become a household name. Here is his story. Hello, Ron. Once again, this is a story my dad told me from when he was younger. He was born and raised in Lagos, Nigeria. One night he was walking home. The sun was just starting to set and in Lagos at the time, there weren't many street lights. So when it got dark out, it got dark out. My dad had been told by my abu, grandma, many times not to stay out too late and be home before the sun goes down. He was a very stubborn person when he was younger, according to his sister, and always blew off everything my abu would say. On this night, he definitely should have listened to her, and if I'm not mistaken, he did after the events I'm about to retell. I'm using Americanized slang, but keep in mind that Yerba is the language that he would have spoken at the time. As he walked, he saw a man standing on the street corner. The man looked at my dad and said, You should get home, kid. It's getting late. My dad, being the jackass he was, said, Screw you, old man. Don't tell me what to do, and went about his leisurely walk home. After a couple blocks, he saw the same man standing on a different street corner. The man said the same thing as before. My dad didn't think much of it and told him to go bleep himself and continued walking. After a few blocks, he saw the same man again, but this time he had a big, snarling dog with him. The old man said the same thing, but this time with a growling dog baring its teeth. My dad was a little more bothered this time, understandably so, but still told the old man to shove it and kept walking. He was nearly home at this point. The sun had gone down, the moon bright in the sky, and he saw him again. 
This time he was just laughing maniacally. Not only was he laughing, but he had two dogs with him now. According to my dad, the dogs and the man's eyes were red, and as soon as he walked past them, the man let the dogs go. My dad took off running as fast as he possibly could, dogs barking, snarling, and giving chase. As soon as he reached my Abu's house, he started pounding on the door furiously, begging her to open up. Once the door was open, he flew inside and told her to shut it fast. My Abu was trying to figure out what was happening. My dad told her about the man and the dogs. My Abu said he was being ridiculous and said, There's nothing out there. She opened the door and saw nothing. However, my dad swore that he could still see the dogs pacing outside back and forth. Teeth sharp, eyes red, fur back, and waiting for him. Akuna Musa, New York. Well, Akuna, that story gave me chills as I read it, and I want to thank you for sharing yet another story from your adventures. Thank you. Well, keeping with the theme of dogs that confound logic, here's a story from Timothy O'Leary. Tim writes to us from St. Paul, Minnesota, and has titled his story, The Scratching Ghost Dog. I believe that there could be a spirit animal in my house, or at least one that comes to visit. I'm not sure what it all means, but I've had three experiences that give me pause. After you've heard these stories, I would very much like to know what you think. Experience 1 I was home alone with my eldest son, who was about one at the time. He was asleep upstairs and I had the baby monitor on. I heard a faint dog bark come from the monitor. Worried that it was my next-door neighbor's dog and that it would wake my son, I went upstairs to check on him and to close his window. In the room he was asleep, and the window was closed. I looked out and didn't see or even hear a dog. I went back downstairs, and a few minutes later I heard a dog bark so loud it sounded like it was directly into the monitor. I ran upstairs again to check on my son, but found nothing. This time I decided to stay to see if I could hear anything. I stood in the bathroom doorway, which is at a right angle to my son's room. The bedroom was propped open by a long toy snake, and it slowly started to slide away from the door. I watched in disbelief. Suddenly the door slammed shut, and my son started crying. I think the noise woke him up. Terrified, I burst through the door, grabbed my son, and ran downstairs. Later. Feeling a bit better, and perhaps a little silly, decided to go to bed. I did take my son to sleep with me in our room. I walked to the bottom of the stairs, and my two cats were around my feet, waiting to be fed. They started walking up the stairs with me a couple steps ahead. About halfway up the stairs, they stopped, started hissing, and then bolted back downstairs. It scared me enough to stop going up. When my wife got home, I told her about it. She said that she had heard a dog earlier that morning. Experience 2 One night around 2 a.m., my wife heard scratching on the door. We keep it closed to stop the cats from coming in at night. At first, she ignored it, but it got so persistent that she got up, switched on the hall light, opened the door, and looked down the stairs. She noticed the dining room light was on, and she could see a small dark shadow moving around in front of the front door. Thinking it was one of the cats, she walked downstairs expecting to see our black cat, but she wasn't there. My wife walked room to room looking for the cats. When she got to the kitchen, she found both of them asleep in their bed. Scared, she turned on every light in the house and went back to bed. The scratching stopped. Experience 3 It was my son's fourth birthday party a couple years ago, and my brother was sitting in my living room. 
When he turned to pick up his drink, he saw a small black dog walk into my kitchen. He knows we have a black cat, but he said this was bigger, and it intrigued him enough to get up and have a look. He walked into the kitchen, and nothing was there. He knew nothing about the previous events that had occurred. We've heard scratching at the bedroom door many times, only to find nothing when we open it. My son is six years old now and has said that a small black dog comes and sits at the end of his bed at night. It couldn't be either cat because they aren't allowed upstairs at night and we ensure that they're downstairs before we go to bed. So run. What do you think? Is this a common thing? I should also mention that we've never owned a dog. I did have one growing up as a child, but he was huge and not a speck of black on him. Timothy O'Leary, St. Paul, Minnesota. Well, Tim, no, this is not a common thing. And I do thank you for sharing your story with us. My best guess is that you do indeed have a ghost dog living in your house. It's not the first time I've heard of something like this, and it probably won't be the last. I guess they like their homes as much as people do. Well, that's our stories for this time. If you have a story that you would like to share, like Tim did, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com, click on the story submission banner, leave your story, give it a title, and please tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. Our featured story comes from the novel The Counterfeit Man, More Science Fiction Stories by Alan E. Norse. It was recommended to us by R.K. Wilcox and is read for us by him. What if your truth sounded too fantastic to believe, and the only person who would believe you is the last person on earth who could help you? That is what the hero of our story faces today. It is titled Circus and first appeared in print in 1963. Just suppose, said Morgan, that I did believe you. Just for argument, he glanced up at the man across the restaurant table. Where would we go from here? The man shifted uneasily in his seat. He was silent, staring down at his plate. Not a strange-looking man, Morgan thought. Rather ordinary, in fact. A plain face, nose a little too long, fingers a little too dainty. A suit that doesn't seem quite to fit, but all in all a perfectly ordinary-looking man. Maybe too ordinary, Morgan thought. Finally, the man looked up. His eyes were dark, with a hunted look in their depths that chilled Morgan a little. Where do we go? I don't know. I've tried to think it out, and I get nowhere. But you've got to believe me, Morgan. I'm lost. I mean it. If I can't get help, I don't know where it's going to end. I'll tell you where it's going to end, said Morgan. It's going to end in a hospital. A mental hospital. They'll lock you up and they'll lose the key somewhere. He poured himself another cup of coffee and sipped it scalding hot. And that, he added, will be that. The place was dark and almost empty. Overhead, a rotary fan swished patiently. The man across from Morgan ran a hand through his dark hair. There must be some other way, he said. There has to be. All right, let's start from the beginning again, Morgan said. Maybe we can pin down something a little better. You say your name is Parks, right? The man nodded. Jefferson Haldeman Parks, if that helps any. Haldeman was my mother's maiden name. All right, and you got into town on Friday, right? Parks nodded. Fine. Now go through the whole story again. What happened first? The man thought for a minute. As I said, first there was a fall, about twenty feet. I didn't break any bones, but I was shaken up and limping. The fall was near the highway going to the George Washington Bridge. 
I got over to the highway and tried to flag down a ride. How did you feel? I mean, was there anything strange that you noticed? Strange? Park's eyes widened. I, I was speechless. At first, I hadn't noticed too much. I was concerned with the fall and whether I was hurt or not. I didn't really think about much else until I hobbled up to that highway and saw those cars coming. Then I could hardly believe my eyes. I thought I was crazy. But a car stopped and, and asked me if I was going into the city, and I knew I wasn't crazy. Morgan's mouth took on a grim line. You understood the language? Oh, yes. I don't see how I could have, but I did. We talked all the way into New York. Nothing very important, but we understood each other. His speech had an odd sound, but... Morgan nodded. I know. I noticed. What did you do when you got to New York? Well, obviously I needed money. I had gold coin. There had been no way of knowing if it would be useful, but I'd taken it on chance. I tried to use it at a newsstand first, and the man wouldn't touch it. Asked me if I thought I was the U.S. Treasury or something. When he saw I was serious, he sent me to a money lender, a uh, hawk shop, I think he called it. So I found the place. Let me see the coins. Parks dropped two small gold discs on the table. They were perfectly smooth and perfectly round, tapered by wear to a thin, blunt edge. There was no design on them and no printing. Morgan looked up at the man sharply. What did you get for these? Park shrugged. Too little, I suspect. Two dollars for the small one, five for the larger. You should have gone to a bank. I know that now. I didn't then. Naturally, I assumed that with everything else so similar, principles of business would also be similar. Morgan sighed and leaned back in his chair. Well, then what? Parks poured some more coffee. His face was very pale, Morgan thought, and his hands trembled as he raised the cup to his lips. Fright? Maybe. It's hard to tell. The man put down the cup and rubbed his forehead with the back of his hand. First I went to the mayor's office, he said. I kept trying to think what anyone at home would do in my place. That seemed a good bet. I asked a policeman where it was, and then I went there. But you didn't get to see him. No, I saw a secretary. She said the mayor was in conference and that I would have to have an appointment. She let me speak to another man, one of the mayor's assistants. And you told him? No, I wanted to see the mayor himself. I thought that was the best thing to do. I waited for a couple of hours until another assistant came along and told me flatly that the mayor wouldn't see me unless I stated my business first. He drew in a deep breath. So I stated it. And then I was gently but firmly ushered back into the street again. They didn't believe you, said Morgan. Not for a minute. They laughed in my face. Morgan nodded. I'm beginning to get the pattern. So what did you do next? Next I tried the police. I got the same treatment there, only they weren't so gentle. They wouldn't listen either. They muttered something about cranks and their crazy notions, and when they asked me where I lived, they thought I was, what did they call it, a wise guy. Told me to get out and not come back with any more wild stories. I see, said Morgan. Jefferson Parks finished his last bite of pie and pushed the plate away. By then, I didn't know quite what to do. I'd been prepared for almost anything excepting this. It was frightening. I tried to rationalize it, and then I quit trying. It wasn't that I attracted attention or anything like that. Quite the contrary. Nobody even looked at me unless I said something to them. I began to look for things that were different, things that I could show them and say, See? This proves I'm telling the truth. Look at it. He looked up helplessly. And what did you find? Nothing. Oh, little things, insignificant little things. Your calendars, for instance. Naturally, I couldn't understand your frame of reference. And the coinage. You stamp your coins. We don't. And cigarettes. We don't have any such thing as tobacco. The man gave a short laugh. And your house dogs. We have little animals that look more like rabbits than poodles. But there was nothing any more significant than that. Absolutely nothing. 
Except yourself, Morgan said. Ah, yes. I thought that went over carefully. I looked for differences, obvious ones. I couldn't find any. You can see that just looking at me. So I searched for more subtle things. Skin texture, fingerprints, bone structure, body proportion. I still couldn't find anything. Then I went to a doctor. Morgan's eyebrows lifted. Good, he said. Park shrugged tiredly. Not really. He examined me. He practically took me apart. I carefully refrained from saying anything about who I was or where I came from, just said I wanted a complete physical examination, and let him go to it. He was thorough, and when he finished, he patted me on the back and said, Parks, you've got nothing to worry about. You're as fine strapping a specimen of a healthy human being as I've ever seen. And that was that. Parks laughed bitterly. I guess I was supposed to be happy with the verdict, and instead I was ready to knock him down. It was idiotic. It defied reason. It was infuriating. Morgan nodded sourly. Because you're not a human being, he said. That's right. I'm not a human being at all. How did you happen to pick this planet, or this sun, Morgan asked curiously. There must have been a million others to choose from. Parks unbuttoned his collar and rubbed his stubbled chin unhappily. I didn't make the choice. Neither did anyone else. Travel by warp is a little different from travel by the rocket you fiction writers make so much of. With a rocket vehicle, you pick your destination, you make your calculations, and off you go. The warp is blind flying, strictly blind. We send an unmanned scanner ahead. It probes around, more or less hit or miss, until it locates something, somewhere, that looks habitable. When it spots a likely-looking place, we keep a tight beam on it and send through a manned scout. He grinned sourly. Like me. If it looks good to the scout, he signals back and they leave the warp anchored for a sort of permanent gateway until we can get a transport beam built. But we can't control the directional and dimensional scope of the warp. There are an infinity of ways it can go until we have a guide beam transmitting from the other side. Then we can just scan a segment of space with the warp and the scanner picks up the beam. He shook his head wearily. We're new at it, Morgan. We've only tried a few dozen runs. We're not too far ahead of you in technology. We've been using rocket vehicles just like yours for over a century. That's fine for a solar system, but it's not much good for the stars. When the warp principle was discovered, it looked like the answer, but something went wrong. The scanner picked up this planet, and I was coming through, and then something blew. Next thing I knew, I was falling. When I tried to make contact again, the scanner was gone. And you found things here the same as back home, said Morgan. The same. Your planet and mine are practically twins. Similar cities, similar technology, everything. The people are the same, with precisely the same anatomy and physiology, the same sort of laws, the same institutions, even compatible languages. Can't you see the importance of it? This planet is on the other side of the universe from mine, with the first intelligent life we've yet encountered anywhere. But when I try to tell your people that I'm a native of another star system, they won't believe me. Why should they? asked Morgan. You look like a human being. You talk like one. You eat like one. You act like one. What you're asking them to believe is utterly incredible. But it's true. Morgan shrugged. So it's true. I won't argue with you. But as I asked before, even if I did believe you, what do you expect me to do about it? Why pick me, of all people you've seen? There was a desperate light in Park's eyes. I was tired, tired of being laughed at, tired of having people looking at me as though I'd lost my wits when I tried to tell them the truth. You were here, you were alone, so I started talking, and then I found out you wrote stories. He looked up eagerly. I've got to get back, Morgan, somehow. My life is there, my family, and think what it would mean to both our worlds. Contact with another human race. Combine our knowledges, our technologies, and we could explore the galaxy. He leaned forward, his thin face intense. I need money and I need help. I know some of the mathematics of the warp principle. I know some of the design, some of the power and wiring principles. You have engineers and physicists, technologists. They could fill in what I don't know and build a guide beam. 
but they won't do it if they don't believe me. Your government won't listen to me. They won't appropriate any money. Of course they won't. They've got a war or two on their hands. They have public welfare and atomic bombs and rockets to the moon to sink their money into. Morgan stared at the man. But what can I do? You can write. That's what you can do. You can tell the world about me. You can tell exactly what has happened. I know how public interest can be aroused in my world. It must be the same in yours. Morgan didn't move. He just stared. How many people have you talked to? he asked. A dozen? A hundred? Maybe a thousand? And how many believed you? None. You mean nobody would believe you? Not one soul until I talked to you. And then Morgan was laughing. Laughing bitterly. Tears rolling down his cheeks. And I'm the one man who couldn't help you if my life depended. Pinned it on it, he gasped. You believe me? Morgan nodded sadly. I believe you. Yes. I think your warp brought you through to a parallel universe of your own planet, not to another star, but I think you're telling the truth. Then you can help me. I'm afraid not. Why not? Because I'd be worse than no help at all. Jefferson Parks gripped the table, his knuckles white. Why? he cried hoarsely. If you believe me, why can't you help me? Morgan pointed to the magazine lying on the table. I write. Yes, he said sadly. Ever read stories like this before? Parks picked up the magazine, glanced at the bright cover. I barely looked at it. You should look more closely. I have a story in this issue. The readers thought it was very interesting. Morgan grinned. Go ahead. Look at it. The stranger from the stars leafed through the magazine, topped at a page that carried Roger Morgan's name. His eyes caught the first paragraph and he turned white. He set the magazine down with a trembling hand. I see, he said, and the life was gone out of his voice. He spread the pages viciously, read the lines again. The paragraph said, Just suppose, said Martin, that I did believe you, just for argument. He glanced up at the man across the table. Where do we go from here? Well, what did you think of that one? I, for one, found it quite original, and the reading was really good. My thanks to RK for that. Alternate realities is something that has always intrigued me. That's probably why I enjoy the Marvel Universe stories so much. Anything can happen. And it usually does. Circus was written by Alan Edward Norse. He was a science fiction writer and physician. He wrote both juvenile and adult science fiction, as well as non-fiction works about medicine and science. His sci-fi works almost always focused on medicine and or some form of psionics, which is relating to or denoting the practical use of psychic powers, or paranormal phenomenon. How about that? Are you ready for another story? This one is being brought to us by Gladys Goodies. Good treats for your dog to eat. They use all natural products with no sugar, preservatives, salts, or harmful ingredients. So check out their online store at gladdiesgoodies.com. That is gladdiesgoodies.com. And don't forget to use our very own promo code, RONS, to get a 20% discount on all of your purchases. That is R-O-N-S. Thank you, Gladdy. Yes, it is Our Amazing Stories. But just what does that mean? We have segments for your stories, one for strange moments in history, and even one that plays clips 
from the golden age of radio to take us back in time. So what makes this segment different? Our Amazing Stories looks at people who did amazing things. So sit back and listen to this incredible tale. This time we look at a man who had a remarkable life. John F. Kennedy was born in Brookline, Massachusetts, was the 35th President of the United States, faced a number of foreign crises, especially in Cuba and Berlin, but managed to secure some incredible achievements before he was assassinated while riding in a motorcade in Dallas. But do you recall his most famous adventure of all, the sinking of PT-109? PT boats were used by the United States Navy in World War II. It was small, fast, and inexpensive to build. It was valued for its maneuverability, had torpedoes, limited armament, and a completely fragile construction that mostly consisted of plywood. It was inspired by offshore powerboat racing and used multiple aircraft-derived V-12 engines that were both lightweight and powerful. They engaged enemy warships, transports, tankers, barges, and armored barges used by the Japanese for inter-island transport. They were nicknamed the Mosquito Fleet and Devil Boats by the Japanese. The PT Boat Squadrons were hailed for their daring and earned a place in the public imagination that remains strong well into the 21st century. And here's the cool part. John F. Kennedy was one of their captains, and here is his story. It is arguably the most famous small craft engagement in naval history, and it was an unmitigated disaster. At a later date, when asked to explain how he became a hero, John replied, It was involuntary. They sank my boat. To understand the events of August 1943, which culminated in the sinking of PT-109, it's important to remember that it was dark. Deeply, incredibly dark. The disorienting effect, even for experienced sailors, of a moonless, starless night on the ocean should not be underestimated. In this profound darkness, PT-109 stood at her station in Blackett Strait in the Solomon Islands, one of the members of an operation born into futility. Fifteen PT boats were set out to engage, damage, and maybe even turn back the well-known Tokyo Express. This was the Japanese Navy's regular supply convoy that prevented the advance of U.S. forces. When the patrol actually did come into contact with the Tokyo Express, they found three destroyers acting as transports, with a fourth serving as an escort. Needless to say, the encounter had not gone well. Thirty torpedoes were fired to no effect. The Japanese didn't even have to change their course. Boats that had used up their complement of torpedoes were ordered home. The few that still had torpedoes remained in the strait in the doubtful hope of catching the express on its return voyage. The only thing that could be said about the action was that the Japanese had not been damaged, nor had the Americans. That was about to change. PT-109 was one of the boats left behind. Lieutenant Kennedy rendezvoused his boat with PT-162, of his own patrol section, and PT-169, which had been separated from another section. The three boats spread out to make a picket line across the strait. At 2.30 in the morning, a shape loomed out of the darkness 300 yards off of PT-109's starboard bow. So difficult was the visibility that it was first believed to be another PT. When it became apparent that it was one of the Japanese destroyers, Kennedy attempted to turn starboard to bring his torpedoes to bear, but there wasn't enough time. The destroyer, later identified as the Amagari, struck PT-109 just forward of the starboard torpedo tube, ripping away the aft side of the boat. 
The impact tossed Kennedy around the cockpit, and his radio man, John McGuire, was actually thrown from it. Most of the crew were knocked or fell into the water. One man below decks, engineer Patrick McMahon, miraculously escaped, although he was badly burned by exploding fuel. Fear that PT-109 would go up in flames drove Kennedy to order the men who still remained on the wreck to abandon ship. But the destroyer's wake dispersed the burning fuel, and when the fire began to subside, Kennedy sent his men back to what was left of the boat. From the wreckage of the boat, Kennedy ordered the men with him to identify the location of their shipmates still in the water. Ensign Leonard Tom, Gerald Zinzer, Ensign George Ross, and Raymond Albert were able to swim back on their own. Kennedy swam out to McMahon and Charles Harris. Towing the incapacitated McMahon by a life vest, Kennedy returned to the boat, alternately coaxing the hurt, exhausted Harris to get him through the difficult swim. Meanwhile, Tom pulled in William Johnson, who was ill by gasoline he had accidentally swallowed while in the water. Finally, Raymond Starkey swam in from where he was flung by the collision. Floating around on the hulk, the crew took stock. Two men had disappeared in the collision, very likely killed on impact. All the men were exhausted, a few were hurt, although none as badly as McMahon, and several had been sickened by fuel fumes. On the other hand, there had been no sign of other boats or ships in the area. The men were afraid to fire their flare gun for fear of attracting Japanese, who were on the islands on all sides. Furthermore, although the wreckage was still afloat because of its sealed bulkheads, it was taking on water and capsized on the morning of August 2nd. After a discussion of options, and aware that time was running out, the men abandoned the remains of PT-109 and struck out for an inlet three and a half miles away that they hoped was unoccupied. Kennedy had been on the swim team at Harvard. Even towing McMahon by a belt through his teeth, he was undaunted by the distance. Several of the other men were good swimmers, but several were not, and two could not swim at all. They were lashed to a plank that the other seven men pulled and pushed as they could. Kennedy arrived first at the island named Plum Pudding, but called by the men Bird Island because of the guano that coated the bushes. Kennedy was so spent that he had to be helped up to the beach by the men that he had towed. Kennedy collapsed and waited for the rest of the crew. But Kennedy's swimming was not over. Alarmed by a Japanese barge that passed close by, he determined to swim into Ferguson Passage, through which the American PTs passed when they were operating in Blackett Strait. He treaded water for an hour before deciding that the PTs were in action elsewhere that night. The return voyage nearly killed him as strong currents spun him out into Blackett Strait and then back into Ferguson Passage. On August 4th, Kennedy led the men back into the ocean, striking out for Lasanda Island in hopes of finding food and fresh water, but also wishing to be closer to Ferguson Passage. Kennedy again hauled McMahon by the strap of his life vest while crew clustered around the plank and thrashed their way along. Oslanda Island proved to be something of a disappointment. The coconuts were more plentiful but had a sickening effect on some of the men. Fresh water was not in evidence and the men were too nervous about Japanese patrols to explore more than a small corner of this larger island. When the night of August 4th turned wet and cold, Kennedy decided to try the next island over the following day. Cross Island was the last in the chain, and its eastern shores looked out over Ferguson Passage. Kennedy and Ross climbed up to the beach a little past noon on August 5th. Fearing enemy patrols, the two men stepped carefully through the brush, but only saw the wreck of a small Japanese vessel out on the reef. On the beach, they spotted a small box with Japanese labels. When they broke it open, they were delighted to discover it contained Japanese candy. 
Even better, a little further up the island they discovered a case of tins of water and a one-man canoe hidden in the bushes. Having had a drink, Kennedy and Ross were just walking back to the beach when they saw two men out at the Japanese wreck. The men, clearly islanders, took flight and paddled away from the wreck of the canoe, despite Kennedy's hails. Uncertain about the outcome of this encounter, that night Kennedy took the canoe out into Ferguson Passage once more, with as little success as previously. Kennedy decided to take the canoe back to Oslana. He stopped there long enough to gather the candy and water to bring to the other men, leaving Ross to rest until the next morning. Arriving at Oslana, Kennedy discovered that the two men he and Ross had seen had made contact with the rest of the crew. The two men were Islander scouts for the Allies. The next morning, August 6th, Kennedy returned with them intercepting Ross along the way as he was swimming back. The Islanders showed the two Americans where a boat had been hidden on Cross Island. When Kennedy was at a loss for a way to send a message, the scouts showed him how it could be scratched into the green coconut husk. The scouts left the island with the message, Commander, Native knows position. He can pilot. Eleven alive. Need small boat. Kennedy. August 7th, eight islanders appeared at Cross Island. They brought food and a message from a local allied coast watcher that Kennedy should come over to Evans Post. Stopping long enough to feed the crew, then the islanders hid Kennedy under a pile of palm fronds and paddled him to Guamu Island in the Blackett Strait. Early in the evening of the 7th, a little more than six days after PT-109's sinking, Kennedy stepped on to Guamu. There was still a rescue to be planned. No small thing in Japanese-held waters, but the ordeal of PT-109 was over. For his courage and leadership, Kennedy was awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Medal, and injuries suffered during the incident qualified him for the Purple Heart. The story was picked up by the writer John Hershey, who told it to the readers of The New Yorker and Reader's Digest. Of course, it followed Kennedy into politics, where it was a strong foundation of his appeal. For here was a hero who had not won battles, but had shown courage and dogged will for those he led and inspired. That's it for this first edition of Our Amazing Stories. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any ideas for stories for this segment or want to write one of your own, please let me know. I would love to work with you on the project and want to hear any ideas that you might have. Just use the contact page on the main website and we'll get it done. Thank you for listening to Our Amazing Stories. was the first podcast of 2022 and was episode number 524. Akuna Musa, Timothy O'Leary, and R.K. Wilcox made it happen today, and I want to thank you for that. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it, and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button makes us grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. (laughs) 